نيكست سبيكر وانا محظوظ يعني انا هقدمه هو دوتش ايبشن نص هولندي ونص مصري اندي ديفلوبر وعمل تولز زي بيرسكت و جيمز عظيمه زي ريديكلس فيشنج زي نيكلر سون سو رامي اسماعيل I'm happy I'm proud to welcome uh, Rami Ismail. Uh, can thank you hear me? I can hear you. Hi. How are you today? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm looking forward to listen from you. Why? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited. I'm I'm really yeah. glad to be here. We well, and of course we are. Um, let me just share my screen then. Um, if you are, let me see. Can you see? I think you can. Yes. Uh, you see. have your mission. Okay, good. Is that working? Yeah, that's great. So, okay. Well, ready when you are then. Oh, uh, wait, is my camera on? No. Oh, let me fix that. Um, where did Zoom go? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Good. Yeah, great. So awesome. uh, I will leave the floor for you. Sure, okay. Uh, Good. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I am Rami Swain. I am a Dutch Egyptian game developer best known for my work at Vlambeer. Uh, we make video games uh, and we did that from 2010 until 2020. I'm also the organizer for GameDev.World, and I've made Prescott. I'm a partner in Indie Fund. I help with IGDA, and I used to organize the Indie Mega Booth when the, when we could still travel around the world. Um, I promised a talk about 25 ways to make better games. Um, so I'm going to give a talk about 25 ways to make better games. I'm going to go pretty fast because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I'm sorry to be doing this in English. I also understand this is going to YouTube. Um, and even though my Arabic is, you know, okay, it's not quite good enough to give 25 rapid, uh, really fast tips on how to be good on game design, for which I'm sorry. Um, I hope to return to Egypt soon. I haven't been for quite a while. Um, and inshallah, I get to, I get to meet you all, uh, when I'm there. So tip number one, dare to be good, dare to be bad at your job. Uh, game development is, uh, always an experiment, right? And even the most famous developers, you know, the best developers, you know, dare to be bad at their job. I've met my heroes from when I was a kid. I've met um i've met um uh, honestly everybody we who didn't i meet i met the romeros i met warren specter i met uh, kojima i met miyamoto uh, and all of them said the same thing they don't know exactly what they're doing they're always experimenting they're always trying to figure it out ego is dangerous to making games so the one thing you want to avoid when making games, any game at all, is knowing what you're doing. You always want to be searching for new things, for experiments, 
for better ways to do the things that you're already doing. So always be learning is what I'm really trying to say. Always be curious. Never think that you have the answers. Um, keep, keep assuming that you're bad at your job. Then um, know the process, right? Game development is complicated and it's an experiment. And one of the ways you can make that experiment go safer is by knowing the process. So the process of game development is pretty similar most of the time, right? You go, you come up with an idea, you brainstorm, you then come up with the correct solution or the solution that you think will work. You test that solution. And then after you've tested it, you see whether it works. If it works, you iterate. So you continue building on it. If it doesn't work, you iterate, you remove that idea and you start over. So your game kind of goes like a little loop. You start small and then you keep testing and testing and testing until eventually it's a big game. If you are in a team, know your team. Your team is probably the most important thing you have and knowing the people that are on it, knowing their strengths, knowing how they talk, knowing when they talk, knowing whether they will uh, call you out when you make a mistake, knowing when they will be um, quiet. Uh, knowing those things really helps. The most important person to know on the team is you. Know how you react to stuff. When I started Vlambe, the first thing I realized working with uh, my co-founder, Jan Willem, the first thing I realized is that when Jan Willem said something that I genuinely thought was good, I would sit down and I would lean back in my chair and I would just think. I'd go like, yeah, because I didn't like the guy. Me and my co-founder, we never liked each other. So we always had to make sure, we had to figure out ways to make sure that we were listening to each other's ideas and finding out how I reacted to a good idea was a way to be better at making games. So know your team, know yourself. When you're brainstorming, know that there's no bad idea. Brainstorming is a safe environment to come up with the worst ideas you've ever come up with. Because sometimes you need to go through a bad idea to get to a good idea, right? When you think about it, every game sort of started from a good idea and a bad idea, right? You come up with the Mario Kart is a terrible racing game. Terrible racing game. Like cars don't behave realistically. Um, you have huge characters. There's bananas. Why is there bananas in a racing game? But then also it's a really fun party game, right? And you can imagine that a game like that started with, can we make Mario do racing? which is a terrible idea. Mario is a platformer. Mario jumps. But then they came up with the idea of, okay, um, what if we made it a party racing game, right? The same way goes for, for pretty much any game you can possibly make. Most games start from a bad idea. Ridiculous Fishing, which is probably my most famous game, started from a discussion about tuna fishing because we were watching a documentary on television about fishing while talking about duck hunt. And it was a terrible idea and we did it anyway. And it was great. So when you're brainstorming, be very careful not to say that's a bad idea and then not do it or just saying no. Brainstorm every idea, including bad ones. When you prototype, prototype small, really small. Every prototype should be so small that you can probably make it in one or two days, right? Prototypes are for your mechanics. They're for the verbs of the game, the things the player does, right? The things the player interacts with, the buttons they press, the way they move the mouse, the way the controller feels. Prototype as small as you can. Don't try to make it pretty. Don't try to make it nice. Don't try to make it sound, sound good or look great. Uh, you're just testing here. Prototype everything to throw it away. 
you're not going to use it for the final code. You're not going to use it for the final game. Prototype throwaway stuff. Your vertical slice needs to be even smaller. Now, a vertical slice is when you take a prototype, you make a prototype of everything. You make, my slides keep moving on their own. Oh, well. um, you make a prototype of everything. So you make a prototype. I got muted. Oh boy, am I unmuted? No, uh, we can hear you. Okay, All right. I got uh, muted for a second. I got a message. You've been muted by the host. I'm like, wow, my talk had to be a lot shorter than I thought. It's okay. Yeah, uh, uh, we'll continue. Um, your vertical slice is a prototype. Is a prototype. I mean, I know I talk fast, but like, come on. Uh, <laughs> um, your vertical slice is a prototype where you put everything you have in. So you put the mechanics, you put the art, you put the uh, sound, you make the vertical slice just as it look just as if it is the final game, but it's just a very tiny part of the game. It's like two jumps in a platformer or um, one course in a racing game or something that is contained and modular, something that is um, that doesn't take too much time, but shows everybody what the game will look like and what the game will play like, what it will feel like. So you put the effects, you put the sound, you put... And the reason you make this is two reasons. The first one is to prove that you can do it, to prove that you can make this game, not just to investors, publishers, no, to yourself. Your team can make this, right? The second is to know how much time it takes to do it. Because if you know how long it takes to make one track, how long it takes to make one level, you kind of know how much it takes to make two levels or two tracks, right? So your vertical slice can be as small as it needs to be to test your game. Um, and for a platformer, that can be multiple jumps. For racing games, that can be one track. For a shooter game, it can be one room, right? Um, the smallest thing you can do to show what your game is. When you are designing mechanics, try to learn to exhaust your mechanics. Now my slides aren't moving at all. Um, so if you have, uh, let's stay with the idea of a platformer, right? You're making a platformer. Now the first thing that should be good in a platformer is the jump. So when you are designing your game, you're designing your platformer, Start by making 25 good jumps. 25 jumps that are all different, but they all have to feel good, right? And then you say, okay, I've tried all the jumps now, but I can't make a game with just jumping, right? What if we add running? So now you design 25 running jumps, right? Um, and then you go, okay, now I've got 25 or 50 or however many you make uh, running jumps that are interesting, a jump where it's a short jump and then a long jump, a jump where it's a long jump and then a short jump, a jump with two styles in between, a jump with one tile in between. And all of those have to feel good. All of them have to be interesting. All of them have to be fun, right? And then um, they go, okay, I want a double jump. You see, you don't add the double jump before you've realized that the running jump isn't good enough, isn't enough for your game, right? So now you add the double jump and now you make 25 or 50 interesting double jumps, right? Um, and then you test them and all of them have to be fun. Can you do a double jump that goes like this? Or can you, do you keep momentum? Or, uh, you know, what exactly does your job, double jump feel like? How does it play? You test, you test, you make 25 good ones. And then you go, okay, what if we need, um, that's not enough for the game. So you go, okay, let's try running double jumps, right? And now you're combining mechanics. Always make a lot is what I'm trying to say. Exhaust your mechanics. Make jumps until you can't come up with new jumps anymore. And then when you're done and you've got these 200 jumps, pick the best 15. Those go in your game, right? That's how you make video games. You test, you test, you test, you keep the best, right? And you don't waste your player's time. If you pick the 15 best ones, you're giving the players only the best of what you've come across. And the players will never see all the tested stuff, right? So they will look at your game and they'll go like, oh, this is the worst jump in the game. You will know 
that there were way worse jumps in the game. They will never know, right? You don't waste your player's time. You, the worst thing in your game should still be worth the player's time. Because in the end, if a player pays $20, $15 for a game, they don't like it. They'll go, oh, it's a bad game, right? But if people spend $20 on a game and they feel it wastes their time, they will hate it. Nothing is worse than wasting your player's time. Wasting your player's money is better than wasting your player's time. So don't waste player time. Only put the best in your game. Test everything. Make sure it's good. Games are like cooking, right? There's a process. We just talked about it. You keep to the process. But the timings, the flavors, they all happen by eye, right? They happen by experience. And I... um I learned a lot about cooking in Egypt from my family, from my aunties, from my teta. Um, and the, the rules were always the same. She would start with the basics, right? The stuff she was making. She would make sure that it's flavored well and then heat them. And there was never a clock. There was never a timer. Teta just looked at the food, tasted it, and went, this is good, right? That process is what I've been talking about this entire time so far. The process is, you know what you have to do you don't know exactly what's going into the meal yet you don't start a meal thinking oh i'm gonna make exactly this you start and you go like oh it's too salty um or it's not salty enough right um and then as you go you taste test you wait you look at whether it's going whether it's going right you you listen to how it sounds um that's how game development works so you start with the basics you flavor them well and then you heat them right um, part of that is rules process. Part of that is intuition. You get better at it as you do it more often. And keep in mind that games, games aren't real. You know, like that, uh, that favorite game world of yours is not real. It's just polygons. The best high score you got in your life, it's just a number, right? All the characters you love in video games that you've played, they're fake. Everything is fake. Everything we do is fake, right? Games happen in players' heads. And they are not real until the player believes them, right? Now, the flip side of that, the other side of that, is that anything in a game is real as long as the player believes it. So if you make a point in the game where the player has to roll a dice, right, and they have to roll a six, and you just make the game always roll a six, it's fine, right? That's, that's okay. Most games are not fair with dice. I use dice as a very specific example. Because dice, dice in games are nonsense, right? We don't actually roll a dice. We don't go random six. No, we make our dice be five or six more often than one or two because one or two aren't good for the player. So we cheat. We cheat for the player. It's okay to cheat for the player. Because when you cheat for the player, the player feels good. And in the end, that's what we're doing, right? We're trying to make the player feel something. And usually we're trying to make the player feel good about how they're playing. Um, so don't be afraid to lie to your player. Because when you think about it, all we do is lie to our player. If you want to understand games, if you want to understand games truly, you have to practice. You have to make games. You have to keep practicing, keep experimenting. But at some point, you have to understand why the things you wor that work for you work. There's an enormous amount of theory out there. Steve Swain, Graf Koster, uh, Romero, like any of that. Uh, there are books about comics that are important to read if you want to be a game developer. There are books about movies that are important to read if you want to be a game developer. There are books about game design that you might want to read if you want to be a game developer. Fauzi Musmar uh, wrote the Arabic book on game design, and you should probably read it. If you can read English well enough to read the game design theory books, you should read the game design theory books. But then after you've read those books, Remember that they are just theory. And that in the end, the things you learn in theory, you have to practice, right? So practice to learn 
read the theory to understand what you've learned and then use that to learn more and keep repeating that cycle. And if what we're doing is smoke and mirrors, if what we're doing is lying to our player, and we always are, remember, right behind the wall in that building is the unity blue background with nothing, right? It's just a grid. There is no house. There is no building. There is no outside. There are no clouds. Um, if you're a magician, the cheapest way to do a trick is the best way to do the trick. Game developers are magicians. So the cheapest way to do a trick is the best way to do a trick. So if you have a window, right, and you're in a skyscraper, you yeah, you can absolutely model the entire city. But can you get away with just sprites, right? Can you get away with an image? Could you get away with modeling the closest buildings and then using an image behind that, right? Could you get away with parallax? What is the cheapest thing to make that you can get away with? That should always be your attitude. What is the cheapest way to convince the player that this is real? What is the fastest way we can do that? Because if you find those ways, you can test them more. You can try them more. You can experiment more. You can iterate more. So if you do things fast, if you do things cheap, you'll make a better game, right? Sounds counterintuitive. People always want to get things right. They want to get things perfect. Perfect is nonsense in video games. Don't do perfect. There's no such thing as perfect. Do fast, do cheap, keep testing. That's how you get close to perfect. Not by thinking about it first and then uh, making it. No, no, no. That's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Try the fastest, cheapest way. Do that. See if it works. Doesn't work? Too bad. Try something else. Does work? Good. Let's keep working on it. Right? If you have your game, right? I play a lot of games by developers. I play a lot of game by, by Egyptian developers. One thing I always tell almost every developer that I talk to, every young developer that I talk to, is that if, if you're in the bus, if you're in the train, if you're in uh, public and you're watching somebody play the game, right? Whether it's on a PlayStation or a computer or a mobile phone, you, you look through a window and you see somebody playing a game. You should be able to understand the game just by watching, without asking, without having to read the tutorial or play the tutorial. You should be able to watch somebody play the game and understand what is happening. When you design your game, make sure your game works that way. Make sure your game works in a way where if somebody is watching the game without a tutorial, without any information, they understand what the player is doing and why the player is doing it. If you're making a shooter game and the player switches to a different weapon, anybody watching should be able to understand, oh, okay, they switched to the shotgun because it's a small room full of enemies, right? If it's a racing game, people should understand that the drift, right, builds up boost. How do you communicate that? Do you use special effects? Is there a bar? Do the wheels start smoking? It doesn't matter. You test, right? But it has to be clear. There's a really good article about this called Design for Subway Legibility. It was written by Zach Gage, who is a dear friend of mine. And if you want to read just one document to make you a better game designer, read that article. Design for Subway Legibility. I'll leave the slide up for a few more seconds so you can write this down if you want. This article is one of the best articles ever written about game design. So I'll leave for a few more seconds. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue. Okay. So the other one, the other talk that is incredibly important is called Juice It or Lose It. It's by uh, Martin Jonasson and Petri Puraho. Many years ago, they did a talk called Juice It or Lose It. And basically what they say is that if you want to reward the player 
you want to reward them with feedback. You want to reward them with effects, with sounds. Every jump that a player makes, the landing should feel good because the landing is proof that the jump was good, right? If you want the player to jump often, you want to make sure that jumping feels good. If you want the player to uh, feel like they've scored a point, you want the you want the game to show it like the player scored a point. If you want to avoid players getting hit, you want to make sure that getting hit feels bad, right? It looks unpleasant. It sounds unpleasant. Juice is emphasis. It's a way to say this is important. So don't add effects to everything. Don't make everything feel important. Make the important things feel important. Make the rest feel functional, right? Now keep your focus. Um, it's easy to forget that there is a heart of your game, but the heart of your game is the thing, the reason you started working on this game. A tiny, a tiny moment, a tiny point of importance. Keep that in mind. Always check whether what you're adding to your game fits the goal of your game, right? Um, so um, say Nuclear Throne was a tiny roguelike. Our focus was always on momentum. The character, the player had to keep moving. So we made it so that if you kill an enemy, they leave experience points on the ground. But those experience points, they disappear after a few seconds and you have to go get them. That's how we got people into rooms full of enemies because otherwise they don't get their experience, right? Uh, so now the players were always fighting. They got into a room, they, they defeated an enemy, and now they had to go into the room to get that experience. And everything we built was built around that idea. Now to move on from ideas about games to sort of managing your team, no game that you can make will ever be worth a developer. So take care of your team. Your team is the most important thing you have and crunching, working too hard, making people unhappy, making people lose their motivation. That no game is worth that. So never accept the idea that the game will be worth it. Take care of yourself, take care of your team, take care of each other. There's not enough game developers out there anyway. Uh, and no game is worth losing even just one of you, right? I've been through crunch. I've been through burnout. It was the worst part, the worst part of my life. I sat behind my computer with a headache, not sure I would ever be able to program again. I've been wanting to make video games since I was six. Since I was a little kid, we got our first computer. You have that burnout, you realize that it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. So don't push yourself. Don't push yourself. Don't lose this job you love. Don't lose this hobby you love. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. When, sorry, when you're, um, when you're working on a game, always be pitching, right? Always be thinking about how do I communicate this idea? How do I communicate this feature? How do I communicate this thing I want to do, this art style I want to follow, this character I've made? You want to get really good at explaining the value of what you're doing, explaining the importance of what you're doing. You can't just sit there and be like, this character is cool. And then expect everybody to go like, oh, yeah, it's cool. Now people will go like, no, the cape is bad. Or like, oh, I don't like the face of the game. Or some, you know, something like it. Something like it. If you want to be good at game development, get good at pitching. Get good at telling people what I've made is important. What I've made is relevant. What I made matters. And it won't just make you a better game designer. It'll make you a better designer. It'll make you a better thinker. It'll make you a better communicator. Now, at the same time, value, value isn't real. Price doesn't exist. The fair development price, the, the fair budget for your game, no such thing. If you are going to work with a small publisher and you get $30,000, that might be a lot of money for them, right? If you work with a huge company, a Microsoft, a Sony, a publisher, Cartoon Network, then $30,000 is nothing. You can make the exact same game and with one company it's worth $30,000 and with the other company it's worth quarter million, right? So value isn't real. Everything about value is nonsense. Value is the value of your game. You want to know what the real value of your game is? Whatever people will pay for it. If you can convince people to pay $25 for your game, now your game is worth $25. If you can convince people to pay $5 for your game, now your game's worth $5 for it, 
right? Price isn't real. People talk about price all the time. They talk about budgets. They talk about value. They talk about it as if it's a real thing. You know what has a real price? A banana. Somebody has to grow it. It has to be transported. Somebody has to plant it. It has to be harvested. It has to be brought to where, where you live. It has to go into the supermarket. This packaging costs a banana as a price. A video game? Video game doesn't have a price. It's digital. We can make a million of them. Right? We can make two million of them. We can make one of them. We can make however many we want. People can copy them. So games don't have a real value. The only value games have is the value people will give for it. Um, this is true both in publishing, in creating budgets, in investment, and in the final price. Right? Whatever you can convince people to pay for any part of the process is what the game is worth. Always think about why. Why am I doing things? Why do I care about this game? If you can figure out why you're doing things, you'll be a better game developer. People go, oh yeah, why do I make games? Because it's fun. Because I like, that's not an answer. Come on. There's better answers. Why do you make games? Hmm? Why do you care? What's so important about games for you that, decide, that made you sit here on, what is it, Thursday? Thursday. And Thursday afternoon, well, you could be doing a million other things, right? You care. You clearly care. You're here. So why is that? What is it? What made you come here? What made you be here, right? And what about that made you be here? StarCraft for me, it was StarCraft, right? I, part of the reason I was here was StarCraft because the level editor, it was just so smart. But why did I think that was good? Why did I think... That was smart, right? Keep asking yourself why. Be that annoying kid that keeps going, why? Like, why is the sky blue? And you're like, uh, you know, light. Light bounces off of molecules in the sky in such a way that it's blue. And they're like, but why are there molecules? It's like, uh, you know, like six-year-olds can be really annoying in that way. But um, they're also very smart. Continuing to ask why is really smart. Be as smart as a six-year-old. Ask yourself why. You over budget, you under promise. Always ask for more money than you need and always ask it for less than you want to do, right? Uh, because if you over budget and you under promise, it's much easier to achieve the thing you actually want to achieve. So ask 30% extra, promise 30% less. Ask for 30% on top of your budget and then promise 30% less levels than you want to make. If you want to make, if you really want to make 15 levels, promise 12. You have a, bit, you have a much better chance of actually making the 15 levels you were talking about. This one I really want to talk with you about because I come across this in a lot of Egyptians, right? We're, we're proud people, right? But we're also worried about the legitimacy of our work, right? We're worried towards our parents. We're worried towards society. We worry that not necessarily people will accept game development as a real job, right? And because of that, we try to prove ourselves really hard. I try to prove my work to my dad, who's, who is an Egyptian from Cairo, from, from Rod al Um I tried to convince him for a decade that my job was real. Right? It took me a decade to convince him that game development was real. And I remember at the start, I kept thinking to myself, Rami, you have to make your dad proud. Right? Yeah, like I, I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to make sure that my family understood what I did. And because of that, I put such high pressure on myself. Right. And I started being a perfectionist. I wanted everything to be perfect so I could show it off. But because of that, I also missed, on a lot, missed out on a lot of opportunities because I kept going, oh, my work isn't good enough. Right or nobody will take this, or uh, I have a bad pitch. I shouldn't submit to this event because I'm not good enough yet. I need to be better. I was trying to not be rejected from things. But the way I was doing that was by just not applying to things, by not trying things, by avoiding things until they were perfect. And nothing is ever perfect. So don't reject yourself when others can do it. Let the other people reject you. Take every rejection as a point of pride that you've tried it, right? Apply to that fund, apply to that grant, apply to that publisher, apply to that job, apply to things, try things, do things. Don't tell yourself, oh, they're not going to take me. 
or they're not going to be interested in me or I'm not good enough or no, no, no. You don't reject yourself. They reject you. And then if they reject you, be proud that you tried, right? It still hurts. Still not great to get rejected, but it's better than not trying. If you're making games, the thing you should spend most time on is selling them. Not making them, not designing them, selling them. Every point, at least if you're making commercial games, every point of your process ultimately leads to selling your game, right? So if you're spending three years of your life on making a video game, but you can't spend three months on making the best shop page, the best Steam page, the best PlayStation page, the best pitch document, the best pitch presentation, pitch deck, if you can't spend three months on that, what are you doing? Those moments matter most. You know, the moment that matters most in selling a game is not whether the game is good. It's whether you can sell to people the idea that the game is good, that it's interesting. Have you seen how many bad games, games that don't look good, games that don't sound good, how many games are the biggest hits of the year? You think that that has to do with just the quality of the game? No, it has to do with how people sell the game. It has to do with the conversation that starts about it, right? has to do with the store page where people look at it and go like, this is the game I want. And sometimes they want a polished game. So your store page should look polished, right? But if your game has a flavor to it, a special way that people talk about it, make your store page fit that. When I develop games, I write a little script that puts out a screenshot as soon as it looks like the way I want. I write a little script that puts out a screenshot every 10 seconds. And at the end of a day of work, I'll go through the folder and I'll pick the five best ones and I'll save them somewhere else. And then when the game is done and I want to make a store page, I have thousands of screenshots that I can pick from and I pick the best five ones, right? And that can take days. Trailers can take days. Writing the little part at the top of the store page can take days. Take those days. Spend that time, right? Um, because ultimately, people decide in seven seconds when they get to your store page. They decide in seven seconds whether they want to continue scrolling or whether they want to leave. So make those first second seconds, make them count. And if you're going to do commercial games, if you're going to try and make this a business, make games, not one game, right? Always be thinking about how does this game help our next game? You don't even have to know what the next game is, but where do you want to be after this game? More community that will buy your last game? More fans? Do you want to have a lot of money to fund your next game? Do you want to self fund? What is your goal? What are you building towards? What are you trying to achieve? right? As soon as you start thinking about making multiple games, you'll make a better game because you'll be thinking about how that game helps your future. So don't just try to make a game. Try to make multiple games. Not at once, but you know, always be thinking about it. A lot of people ask me about price. The price of your game should be the thing you want to sell it for. The price you want to sell it for plus 25%. Why plus 25%? So then you can discount the 25%. If you want to make a game that's $10, sell it for $13. And then whenever you have the opportunity, drop it to $9.99, discount, 20% off. People will buy it, right? So price higher than you want it to, and then discount often. And now I've told you all these rules, right? All these things we've talked about. I'm telling you that none of those rules are real. Everything is a suggestion. Everybody makes games their own way. There's no right way of doing it. There's bad ways of doing it, but there, there, there's no wrong ways of doing it. Um, there's no right ways of doing it. Always be trying to figure out what works best for you. Never listen to somebody else. Don't listen to me, right? The things I tell you are from my experience. They're things I've learned. I genuinely think that these are good advice. If it doesn't work in your studio, if it doesn't work with the way you make games, who am I? I'm just a game developer. I've been around for a while, but the way you work might be better for you. The reason I give you these rules, the reason I give you these slides is so that you can go, oh, that sounds smart. Or I should try that. And you, you test whether it fits in your life. And if it doesn't, don't do it. Don't let anybody tell you how to make games. Um, just don't be arrogant enough to think that you have all the answers yet. I don't think I have all the answers. You might have better answers. If you figure them out, let me know. And let me know because you're a community, right? Game development is a together thing. And the best thing you can do, the best thing anybody can do is help the people that are next to you and under you. 
help the people that are up and coming. Use your experience to teach others. Don't try to network up, right? Don't try to meet famous people or big developers. No, no. Try to help the developers around you. Because when one of them has a success, all of you have a success, right? So help each other out. Please help each other out. Help each other with networking. Help each other with knowledge. Help each other with playtesting each other's game. Be a community. That's how you make things better for everybody. Be a community. Work together. Share your opportunities. Share your network. Um, share everything. When we started in the Netherlands in 2010, there was no indie scene. And now there's hundreds. And everything about that is good for us. The government now cares. The, um, the amount of publishers to check out Dutch games is much bigger. People look at Dutch design as an important design, game design thing. Ten years ago, that didn't exist. We just all helped each other out, be bad at making video games. And now here we are. So help each other out, be a community. And then finally, there's never enough time to do everything you want. I don't think there was enough time to do all these slides. I think I went over time, probably. Um, it's, better, it's better to under-promise, right? It's better to promise less than what you want to talk about and then over-deliver, right? Um, in my case, 25 was way too much. I should have gone with like 15 tips that would have made this talk much better. But I said 25 tips. And, you know, if I say 25 tips, I'm going to do 25 tips, but I definitely overscoped. This is a problem that you will have as a game developer for the rest of your life, you will always overscope. Keep that in mind. And then scope lower, <laughs> always scope down. Don't promise a talk with 25 tips, promise a talk with 10 tips, and then just have 15 tips. Way smarter. Don't be like me. And then finally, ask questions. When you have an opportunity, when you can, ask questions. Ask questions of people with different experience, people with more experience, people that have been in the industry, people that are new to the industry. Be curious. Always be asking questions. Always be trying to figure new things out. Always be curious. That was it. Thank you so much, Shukran. Thank you very much, Romy. Thanks for your time and the presentation. It was informative. And uh, despite the busy schedule of you, I know. So uh, I think, uh, as you said, we can ask you questions right now. Yes. <laughs> so we can jump to the questions live. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know. Can I see the question somewhere? Maybe in the chat, but there's nothing right now. Um, yeah, let me put those in. Uh, if you if you can pick some question real quick, I'll answer the one Would that you... I'm seeing. Yeah, okay. Steve Swing. Okay. And yeah. Next. Somebody asked, would you mind if you mention game design books and the game designer name as a text, please? And the two books I always recommend are uh, Game Feel by Steve Swink and uh, The Fundamentals of Game Design, I think, by Raph Koster. Uh, those are two very good books. Um, the Arabic one was written by Fauzi Mesma. Um, yeah. And you should, always, you should also check that one out. I think it's called uh, Mikhlab, uh, El Khalab, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about ridiculous fishing game? Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, so it was. Um... So Ridiculous Fishing was a game for iOS and Android, and it was originally a flash game called Radical Fishing. And it was made because we watched a documentary on TV about fishing while we were talking about Duck Hunt. You know Duck Hunt, the game with the little plastic uh, gun that you aim at the TV? Um, and we were talking about that, and then there was a fish on the screen. And we were like, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if you, if you shoot the fish? Um, that's, where it's, that's where it started. Um, 
and then we just try to make that. And the first thing we realized is if it was going to be a flash game, right, the market context of the game was that it was going to be a flash game. And people play flash games uh, back in those days anyway uh, at school. Right. So it had to be short. It had to fit in a lunch break. Um, and more importantly, there were hundreds of flash games, thousands probably, um, that were out there. So we also had to make sure that it felt good. So we made a rule that everything in the game should feel like progress. Everything in the game should feel like you're almost at the next thing that you can unlock. So we made a store and we made the progression really, really uh, important. So we made it so that anything you buy makes you go deeper into the water. <clears throat> because the deeper you go, the more interesting the fish you were going to find and the more fish you could catch in one go. So um, it was all built around the idea of letting the people think about, oh, I can, what if, what kind of cool fish are there if I get deeper? Or I just need one more game to buy the next item, right? Um, so a lot of it was built around this idea of positive feedback. Uh, and that's kind of how ridiculous fishing happened. When we switched from flash to mobile, we just asked the same questions again. What do people want on mobile? Um, what do people want in a free-to-play game? And then instead of making a free-to-play game, we made a premium game. Uh, we just took the lessons from um, free-to-play games. Um, which is another like lesson, like, you know, get inspiration everywhere. Get inspiration from games you hate and from genres you hate. It's really helpful. Um, yeah, any, did you see any more questions? Yeah, there's uh, two or three okay. uh, more questions. The first one, how important is the independent, if you meant the independent studios, and how do you feel about the recent news of uh, Tencent trying to buy out uh, to take? Uh, take two, yeah. Um, I mean, independence, Independence is only important if you care about independence, right? Uh, some people don't. Some people care about stability, and that's fine. Like, independence is entrepreneurship, right? You own a business. And if you own a business, you're at risk, right? You have to fight to make sure that you can keep doing the thing you love. Well, um, with a buyout, if you work for somebody else, you just get a salary, right? You do your job, you get a salary. Maybe you'll get fired, maybe not, but... You won't go bankrupt. You're not risking your house. You're not risking your life. You're not risking the the ability of your friends to pay for their stuff, uh, for their house, for their life, for their family. Um, so independence is important if it, it's important to you. Do I care about what Tencent does in the AAA space? I mean, a little. If they're going to do a hostile takeover, if Take-Two doesn't want to be funded or bought by Tencent, yeah, then that ain't cool, right? But with Riot, uh, with all the other acquisitions Tencent has been doing, like those studios wanted that. They were looking for funds from somebody who won't get involved with the creative part of game development. And um, for a lot of studios, that's fine. Like if you will give them money but stay out of their commercial, out of their creative work, then they'll take the deal. Um, and for a lot of for a lot of companies, they're asking about millions of dollars, right? They recently, Tencent, uh, I think, acquired or got a large share of Clay Games, um, and they did another one uh, recently for thirty million and got a minor stake in that studio. Um, that's fine. The developers want it. Developers know best. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody else to run their business. Would I do it? Unless I need a lot of money, probably not, right? I like my independence. For me, that's important. Do you recommend small indie game studios to make large-scale games? No. No. Make large-scale games only if me saying no doesn't stop you from making large-scale games. Make small games. That's what we're good at. We're good at making small games. You make big games if you're confident. Um, but even if you make big games... Focus on small things. Make sure that the small things feel great. Um, make sure your core mechanics feel great. Walking feels great. Go play Animal Crossing. 
If you play Animal Crossing, nothing in that game uh, is particularly interesting in terms of mechanics. But you know what's great about Animal Crossing? Walking. Walking in Animal Crossing is great. The way movement feels, like it's a little floaty. You don't immediately stop. It looks cute. Uh, I could run around my Animal Crossing island for an hour and be happy, right? That's how you make games. You make the small things, the things that the player are doing most, you make that feel good. Yeah. And uh, there is one more question. Uh, sure. How would how would the work uh, day in Glampir? And when will Ultrabox come out? Uh, right. Um, Ultrabox will come out in the future. It's in certification right now. And, you know, we can't rush certification. So um, we're waiting. We're waiting for that to be done. Um, as soon as cert is done, we'll have a release date and we'll let you know as soon as possible. The studio doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, we, we quit Flambeer in 2020. Um, so we, um, there is no work day at Flambeer anymore, but it used to be pretty much a normal work day, right? I would wake up, check the email, make sure nothing important was happening figure out the deadline, talk to the team uh, if needed, and then do work. Program, um, test, bug test, feedback. Uh, we play test very early. We start play testing within weeks of our first prototype. So managing that, handling that. Um, a work day just looked like a work day at a game studio. And then I was traveling a lot of the time, so that kind of affected it. Um, so yeah, ultra bugs um, coming out in the future. Uh, there's nobody full time at the studio anymore, so everything goes a little slower. But you know, it's fine. Um, I was happy to shut down Vlambeer, even though uh, it was fine. We had a good time. We just there was nothing more to make for that studio. We both have new plans. Me and my co-founder. Um, I have bigger plans. He has different plans. So we're just both going on new adventures, and it's going to be cool. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, and there's uh, Ahmed Chalafi. Wait, yeah, in Nuclear Room, uh, he thinks that the aspect ratio for three was that decision decision for uh, game design purpose or, or uh... in general, you can think of any choice in any game to be with purpose. Not much happens in game development without a purpose. And even if it's just because people left it that way because it was easier, that's that's a purpose, right? Uh, in Nuclear Throne, the aspect ratio was very intentional. Um, we tried having it 16 by 9, but it meant that people would move to the left and right way more than they would move up and down because um, they would see more. Right, they would see more in those directions, so it would be safer to go in those directions. So we made the screen four by three, so that's a little closer to um, to to the the sort of um, perfect square ratio where people have the same information in all directions. Um, it didn't start that way. It started because all of our games are in three hundred and twenty by two hundred and forty resolution, right? Which is old school four by three resolution. But then when we were trying. 16 by nine, we realized that there was actually a huge advantage to the square ratio. So uh, yeah, that was, that was intentional. So, um, so for create box is cool and hard. <laughs> yeah, because of the force. So. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, any more questions or um if what make what makes you decide if you want to hire a Zach game designer or not right um, <laughs> let me let me ask the funny question above real quick as well why does riot games make a lot of spaghetti code every studio makes a lot of spaghetti code riot games has been working on league for what like how old is that game like seven years or something i could barely make a project for three weeks and not have spaghetti code like you start writing something, you're like, oh, that doesn't work. You fix it. I can't imagine having hundreds of heroes with all their unique mechanics and then a code base of like seven years. There is, there is genuinely 
There's a game studio, a big game studio, makes some of the best games, uh, game of the year winners, like all of that, right? The engine that they use is an in-house engine that they've used for like 10 games, 15 games, right? And near the start of the code, right, near the entry point for the code, there's a line that is commented out, right? It's commented out. Um, so it shouldn't do anything. If you remove that line of code, the game crashes. Nobody knows why. Nobody knows why, right? Nobody at the studio knows why. The people that wrote that code are no longer at the studio. Nobody knows why it crashes. And for now, it's been years and years and years since the original line was written. And they just can't delete it. So they just leave it. That's how game development works. Like, we all write spaghetti code. And if we were making something at the scale of Riot Games, like, nobody's going to write pretty code doing that. It's all duct tape. All, all big games, every game that's released is duct tape. Nuclear Throne is duct tape. Ridiculous Fishing is duct tape. Super Crate Box is an embarrassing amount of duct tape, right? Um, it doesn't matter. The, the point is that it works, right? And yeah, sure, there's benefits to writing well-maintained code, but nothing that gets made over 10 years of time will ever be pretty code. You will always look at it and be like, why is this? And it's just like, eh, I don't know. If I don't do it that way, it crashes. Uh, too bad. You know, so, um, yeah. Exist. <laughs> right, like it's a miracle that games work. Yeah, that's a big question. Oh yeah, if I, if I want to hire a game designer or not, that was the question, right? That's the question you asked yeah. me. Yeah. Right, sorry. Um, honestly, I sit down and I talk with them. I talk, like that's all I want from a game designer. I don't... The thing with a game designer is, and actually to think with any job in the industry, people think that the best way to get a job in the industry is be the best at what you do, right? I'm going to tell you right now, you are not the best programmer I can hire. And you're not the best artist I can hire. You are not the best sound designer I can hire. You're not the best musician I can hire, right? There's people better than you, right? For almost everybody on earth, except for the best person, there's people better than you. Right. What I'm looking for in anybody I can work with. Uh, I'm probably not even the best boss that you can find. Right. I'm not the best business guy. I'm not the best marketeer. I'm not the best game designer. Um, the honest truth is I'm looking for somebody who communicates well. Somebody who feels like a nice person. Somebody who can communicate their ideas. That can talk about why they make decisions. That take responsibility for mistakes they've made. Um, I try to trip them up and see how they how they react to that, right? Like I'll ask them a very difficult question um, or a trick question and then see how they respond, right? Um, what I'm looking for is communicators. In art, in programming, in design, I'm more looking for team players. So if you're a good programmer, that's good enough for me, right? It's good enough for me. I don't need the best game designer on my project. I need a good game designer. They need to fit my project. They need to have the right attitude. More importantly, I need them to talk with my team. I need them to communicate. I need them to let me know that they need more time, that their timeline isn't good, that they uh, overscope. I need them to have that experience. So I care way more about whether somebody is, is good at explaining why they made a choice than about the choice itself. I don't care. I don't care what the choice is, as long as they can justify it to me. Yeah. Uh, Shreef Nade is asking, uh, what mindset do you think uh, is, uh, uh, should someone early starting game development should have? Uh, he was making a roguelike game and was thinking uh, why he's doing that. Since it was just a project for him, or right? Why? I mean, why why make a roguelike? Is that the question? He was asking, "What mindset do you think uh, someone should uh, should have uh, when, the, when, when they're just starts? starting out?" Yeah. Right. All right. Um, the mindset you should have is make bad games. 
right? Um, make bad games. Don't make good games. If you're just starting out, make bad games. Uh, make a lot of bad games. The story that I was taught, that I always thought was the smartest story, is that a long time ago, right? Uh, I think this story comes from the Roman era. Um, a long time ago, there was a teacher who had, who was trying to figure out how students learn best. So he had a pottery school where they make pots and plates, you know, with an oven, and he he split the class into two groups, and one group he told. For an entire year, you make one vase, right? One vase. And you can read about it, you can think about it, you can talk about it, but you make one vase, you have a year, and I will grade the first vase you make, right? And the other team, he said, you can make a vase, you have to make a vase every day. You don't, you don't get to spend more time on a vase. You get one day to make a vase, um, but you have to make one every day. And at the end of the year, I will judge the last one, but you can't take more than a day, right? Um, and obviously the second group make better vases, right? Because they got to try over and over and they started just like, how do I even make a vase? And then by the end of the year, they were making great vases every day because every day they got to learn a way to make bad vases until eventually their bad vases turned into good vases. So don't try to make the best game ever now. Just make, make games. Make make whatever. No no expectations. Don't set your goals too high. Make bad phases, right? Make bad games, and then go from there. Um, it's much better to do a lot of small projects than f that fail, than one big project that fails, right? And your first projects they'll always fail. That's how it works. Uh, game development is not something where you just my first game is great. That's not how it works. Even people that say my first game went great probably have years of experience in creative fields. For sure. I think that's the last question uh, as we're running out of time. Of course. I watched uh, videos, I watched videos where you talked about Arabic language presentation in games. <laughs> Do you think that uh, this will be make a difference or will it ever get better? Let's just say that, as we all know, computers were not made for Arabic, right? or sort of like a patch to computers. Um, but getting it right should really be a minimum, right? It, it doesn't look that important that they get the language right, but really it's, I think it's about respect. It's about respect of, of our language. It's about respect of our culture. It's about respect for our people. Um, and I think it's important. So um, every time I see anybody do bad Arabic, I'm going to drag them on Twitter, right? I'm going to go on Twitter and I'm going to tell 180,000, 200,000 game games industry people that they messed it up um, until they stop messing it up, right? Um, and I get a lot more embarrassed messages nowadays than I used to get, right? When I was starting to talk about this back in 2013, nobody cared. But now I get messages from people at big studios, which is like, I'm so sorry. Um, I didn't check the Arabic before we launched, and I think it's bad. I think we did. We did. I'm so sorry. Can uh, we will fix this really fast? Um, so you know, will it change? I don't know. Will it get better? Yes, it's it's already better. It should always be good. But uh, if they get it wrong, we have something to laugh about. You know, which is also nice. We get to point and laugh and be like, "Wow, these people spent fifty million dollars on a game and they couldn't get," you know. <laughs> they couldn't get salam alaikum right like come on yeah hitman 3 i was laughing at hitman 3 that was pretty bad uh i talked to io and they're fixing it they're they're patching it in uh in a in an update soon uh, okay. yeah. uh, Well, this is a fun silence. Sorry for that. I'm saying that uh, the question, questions is not going to stop uh, for sure. So uh, we can uh, end up. Or, uh... 
Right. Now, um, yeah. Thank you very much for. Yeah, for those of you who have questions that I didn't get to answer, find me on Twitter, t h a underscore rami, or email me info at ramiismail dot com. If you want to talk a bit more, um, at the top of my Twitter is a link for free twenty minute phone calls. So if you want to do a twenty minute phone call to talk about your game, to talk about your problem, uh, to ask a question that you didn't get to ask today. Uh, go to that link on my Twitter at the top, uh, and just submit there. Uh, it was an honor speaking to you all, um, and a pleasure. And and thank you to the organizers for having me and making this happen. Um, I wish you the very best of luck in your game design career, and uh, inshallah, I'll get to meet you all um, in Egypt uh, when I when I return after many years. So. Uh, shukran for having me and um, inshallah inshallah uh, pleasure is us and we and i need to thank you again for your time uh and the tips you in the presentation you questions talk us away <laughs> so uh thank you romi and see you soon inshallah.